Today, most satellite internet service comes from geostationary satellites, or geosatellites. Uh, these satellites are, are, these are satellites that sit at one point very high above the Earth and provide connectivity over a broad area. The main drawback of this setup is that you have a higher latency or delay in the signal provided because they're so far above the Earth. Satellites like this are also generally more expensive to produce and launch. Low Earth orbit satellites are much closer to the Earth and so have much lower latency or delay in their signal. The satellites are also smaller and less expensive to launch. Here you can see an animation that represents how the Starlink constellation operates. Again, you have a high number of satellites in constant motion covering all parts of the globe. And since they're so low to the Earth, that latency or the delay from the signal going from the ground to the satellite and back down to the ground is much lower than a geostationary satellite. We've learned a lot over the past year and have had a lot of fun testing out the capabilities of those two test satellites. Uh, we successfully communicated with ground stations to run 4K video and even play video games over the link. And we also partnered with the Air Force Global Lightning Program to demonstrate how uh, over 600 megabits per second of throughput to an aircraft in flight, which is super exciting for those of you who travel frequently. The bulk of our team working this project is based in Redmond, Washington, and uh, watching today's exciting launch, as you can see on your screen right there, uh, they're just as excited as we are in Hawthorne uh, to see this rocket take off tonight. As I mentioned earlier in the webcast, this is our first launch of a production design satellite system uh, as part of our effort to launch a next generation broadband internet satellite constellation. This will be, uh, fun fact, this will actually be the heaviest payload ever flown on a Falcon 9 rocket, weighing roughly 30,000 pounds. Each of those individual 60 satellites weighs about 227 kilograms or 500 pounds each. So while they're smaller than a typical communication satellite, they're still pretty sizable when you stack them all together. And that flat panel design maximizes space, allowing for a very dense launch stack, as you can see right on your screen right now, uh, to take full advantage of that Falcon 9's launch capabilities. Starlink is also the very first Krypton-propelled spacecraft ever flown. Aside from being the native planet of Superman, Krypton also happens to be a nice blend of cost-effective and efficient propellant for ion propulsion. These ion thrusters enable the satellites to orbit rays, maneuver in space, and deorbit at the end of their useful life. The satellites also have a singular on-orbit solar array. This is one larger panel instead of two, which minimizes potential points of failure. Solar cells are standardized and easy to integrate into the manufacturing process. The Starlink satellites are also equipped with an autonomous collision, of collision avoidance system. Uh, to our knowledge, this is the first of any satellite constellation ever. The satellites use inputs from the Department of Defense's uh, debris tracking system to autonomously perform maneuvers to avoid collisions of space, space debris and other spacecraft. The capability, uh, this capability reduces human error, uh, error, which allows for a more reliable approach to collision avoidance. In addition, 95% of all the components on the satellites are demisable, which means that when these satellites are at the end of their life, they will be naturally slowed by the Earth's atmosphere and ulti ultimately be vaporized into dust as they re-enter. At 95% demisable, the satellites exceed current safety standards, and future iterative designs will go even further, shifting to a full 100% demisable material design. Also, while flying at a lower altitude of 550 kilometers, we ensure that the satellites will quickly and easily demise at the end of their life cycle. Once they reach the end of their life, the satellites will uh, utilize their onboard ion propulsion system to deorbit over the course of a few months. In the unlikely event that a propulsion system becomes inoperable, the satellites will naturally passively decay because of air, uh, atmospheric drag uh, within one to five years, which is significantly less than the 25-year industry standard for low Earth orbit. Uh, or the thousands of years required if you're at a higher altitude. We are Two minutes, 15 seconds. Falcon 9 configured for flight. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition, lift off. Vehicles pitching downrange. Visual propulsion nominal. At operation securing, step section 59 on LVNet. Telemetry nominal. You 
are watching the Falcon 9 as it ascends through the Falcon atmosphere carrying supersonic. the SpaceX Starlink payload of satellites. Coming up in just a few seconds here, the vehicle is going to be passing through max Q. That is the point of maximum aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle. Let's listen for that call out. Vehicle is experiencing maximum aerodynamic pressure. The vehicle has passed through max Q, which means that the atmosphere is only, only going to get thinner from here on out. Uh, coming up shortly at T plus two minutes and 35 seconds is going to be, or excuse me, T plus two minutes and 32 seconds is going to be MECO. That stands for main engine cutoff. That's when those nine Merlin engines you can see burning on your screen right now will shut off or cut off. Uh, shortly, only a few seconds after that, will be stage separation at two minutes and 35 seconds, quickly followed by SES-1. That stands for second engine start one. That's when that uh, single Merlin vacuum engine will ignite after stage separation. All telemetry looks nominal from that first stage right now, and trajectories look good. You can Recovery see the exhaust AOS. gases of those nine Merlin engines uh, expanding as it gets further and further up into the atmosphere. Stand by for Miko in about five seconds. Stage separation confirmed. You can see it on your screen and you can hear it through the cheers of the crowd here at SpaceX headquarters uh, that we just had a very a good Miko, we had a good stage separation and we had a good second engine start. That second stage is now burning brightly on the right hand side of your screen, accelerating the Starlink stack towards its deployment altitude. On the left-hand side of your screen, you can see the view, uh, a view of the Earth, actually, a beautiful view of the curvature of the Earth and all the lights of the uh, eastern seaboard of the United States. That camera on the left-hand side is attached to the top confirm. towards the inner stage of the uh, first stage. And on your right, you can see the fairing deploy from that Starlink satellite stack. The crowd here at, headqu at uh, headquarters cheering. I'm sure everyone up in Redmond is happy, too. So at this point in the mission, uh, there are two things happening simultaneously. On the right-hand side of the screen, you can see that's the SpaceX Starlink stack right there, now exposed to the vacuum of space that we've jettisoned that payload fairing from the top of the rocket. Right now, you can see a view of the bottom of the second stage. That is the Merlin vacuum engine, uh, currently burning brightly, doing its first of two burns to raise those satellites up to their deployment altitude of 440 kilometers above the Earth. The next step for this second stage is going to be SECO-1. That's going to happen at 8 minutes and 47 seconds. But while that's happening, we'll be watching the first stage also coming back down towards the surface of the Earth. This will be the third time that we have attempted to recover this first stage, this particular first stage. Uh, those of you who have seen previous landing attempts may notice that we are not doing a boost back burn today. Uh, this is because boost back burns are typically used to cancel out the horizontal velocity of a first stage as it goes away from the, uh, the launch pad and then bring it back towards the Cape. For tonight, we're doing a drone ship landing on Of Course I Still Love You, so we just position the drone ship out in the Atlantic Ocean Second and catch stage it is following at the end of its trajectory. No need for a boost back burn here. Without a boost back burn, the next step coming up for the first stage will be the entry burn at T plus six minutes and 23 seconds. The entry burn will last for approximately 20 seconds and then shut down. And then after that, we'll be heading towards a landing burn. All telemetry looks good from that second stage as it continues to pick up speed towards that intended deployment altitude.
So as I said earlier, the first stage is now about to start its entry burn at six minutes and 23 seconds. This entry burn is uh, to slow that first stage down just a little bit before it hits the thicker regions of the atmosphere. You can see the camera on the first stage on the left-hand side of your screen right now. It's dark, stage but one, in a few minutes, those Merlin in, uh, engines at the bottom of that first stage will light up, and there stage they go. One, entry burn is started. That is the start of the entry burn. And stage one, entry burn shut down. And that's it. That is the end of the entry burn. The next step for that first stage is going to be the landing burn. You can see some uh, aerodynamic uh, flows past those grid fins right now on the first stage as it gets into the thicker and thicker regions of the atmosphere. Those grid fins help Second stabilize the first stage as it heads back down towards the deck of Of Course I Still Love You. Stage one is transonic. Also signal stage one, Cape Canaveral, as expected. All telemetry is nominal on the second stage as it continues to accelerate. Next big uh, thing happening here is going to be the landing burn at T plus eight minutes and nine seconds, just about 30 seconds from now. For those of you just joining us, we did have a successful liftoff at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time from Cape Canaveral. The first stage was able to successfully separate and is now heading back for its third landing attempt in its history. Stage one landing burn has started. The landing burn has started as scheduled. Uh, we don't currently have video from that first stage, but stand by. Vehicles we may be able to get, get something from the drone ship. Landing burn started at 8 minutes and 9 seconds, and the landing is scheduled landing for 8 minutes and 30 seconds, just about now. You Stage can tell here at SpaceX FDS headquarters we haven't yet gotten any video from the drone ship, but we're just waiting for confirmation. And this is recovery. Falcon 9 has landed. Landing operators moving to procedure 11.100 on recovery 1 and ECF 9. While we're waiting for that, we are expecting SECO to happen shortly. That is second engine cutoff. Back shut down. It sounds like we may have confirmation that the first stage has landed. That is a shot from Of Course I Still Love You of the first stage of the Falcon 9 rocket for its third landing. Not my Falcon Always great to see those first stages come back. Uh, while that was happening, we did have our second engine cutoff one. Uh, that's the end of the second stage's uh, first burn. And, and we did have confirmation of a good orbit for that second stage. Uh, right now, uh, we're about to enter a coast phase. Uh, so we are going to take a quick break, but we're going to leave you with an animation that shows where we are in the coast phase. We will be back at about T plus 45 minutes into the mission for a second stage relight, followed by, by another short coast phase, and then payload deploy. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to bring that deployment to you live on the webcast. So we will see you back here in about 35 minutes. Don't touch that dial. Welcome back to the webcast for the Starlink mission. For those of you just joining us, we did have an on-time liftoff from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time. After that, the first stage was able to take the second stage up into the atmosphere and then return for a third time on the deck of Of Course I Still Love You. All the while, the second stage was able to complete its first burn, and uh, it is now just about to start its second burn. We have two events coming up here, one at T plus 45 minutes and 56 seconds. That'll be SES-2, or Second Engine Start 2. This is the second of two burns that the second stage will be performing before deploying the payloads at their intended deployment or altitude of 440 kilometers above the Earth. So with just about 10 seconds until SES-2, let's watch. Uh, this will be a short one, only about three seconds of burn.
and back ignition. Shut down. And there it is. That was short and sweet, but that was the second stage's second burn. Seco 2 just commenced. That's the second engine cutoff, too. Uh, just waiting right now for confirmation that the second stage is in a good orbit. And we do have confirmation that the second stage is in a good orbit. Uh, so that completes the two of two burns for good that second stage. We are going to uh, go to one more brief coast phase, only about 15 minutes. At about T plus one hour and one minute, we'll come back to guide you through payload deploy, just 15 minutes from now. Welcome back to the webcast for the Starlink mission. Uh, just for those of us joining us, we did have an on-time liftoff at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time from Cape Canaveral. That first stage was able to accelerate the second stage into orbit and then touch back down on the deck of Of Course I Still Love You. And then the second stage was able to complete its two scheduled burns. The second stage is now currently at the target deployment altitude of 440 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. As you, as you can see on your screen right here, this is a beautiful view of those, uh, the stack of those Starlink satellites as they prepare for deployment. Deployment is scheduled for T plus two minutes and 10 seconds. Let's stand by and watch. This uh, brief loss of signal was expected. We should be able to get that video back very shortly. Stand by. Starlink Constellation deploy confirmed. And we have confirmation of deploy. You can hear the team in the background. Uh, this is an incredible moment for SpaceX. You can see those flat-packed Starlink satellites slowly gliding away from the top of the second stage. This is the highest number, satellites, uh, highest number of satellites that SpaceX has ever deployed in a single time. There are no deployment mechanisms between those uh, spacecraft, so they really are just uh, slowly fanning out like a deck of cards into space. You can see those spacecraft starting to separate as they naturally glide away from each other. The sun is glinting pretty strongly off the uh, panels and the bodies of those spacecraft. Uh, so it's tough to see them individually, but you can kind of see one breaking away from the pack right now. Those spacecraft will slowly disperse over time. With that uh, successful deployment, we're going to be bringing the webcast to a close. Uh, for those of you who uh, just caught the end here, we did a successful liftoff, uh, successful first and second stage and uh, activities, and then finally a beautiful deploy, as you can still see ongoing on your screen right now at 440 kilometers above the Earth. Uh, it's been a very exciting launch day today here at SpaceX, but we really are just getting started. Uh, please, thank you uh, to the 45th Space Wing for range safety and to the FAA for licensing today's launch, as well as the FCC for our first operational Starlink satellite licenses. Uh, we'd also like to thank all of our viewers for tuning in. Please follow our website and social media platforms for updates on our next missions and milestones. It's been an honor to host tonight's webcast. Have a good night.